A quick announcement before we dive into the news. I'm attending the Deep Dish Swift conference in Chicago in May. I'm doing a live recording of the launched podcast with Charlie Chapman. So leave a comment if you're going to that conference. I'd love to meet some of you. And as always, links to all the stories you see will be in the Swift News GitHub repo. All right, let's dive in. The obvious huge event for February is the Apple Vision Pro launched. And you're probably already sick of hearing about it by now. But let's be honest, Apple doesn't launch a new platform very often, so this is a very big deal. I got mine on launch day and I've been playing with it for the past few weeks. And in my opinion, this will be a viable platform for developers. Now, of course, it's version one. It's not there yet, but I don't think this is going to be uh, the Apple Watch or the Apple TV. Not that those are bad platforms, but they weren't this bubbling opportunity for developers. Now, of course, it's not gonna get to iPhone levels of adoption and opportunity, but I don't think this is a platform you should ignore. I think there's gonna to be tons of opportunity for Vision OS apps over the coming years. And on that note, here's some links to dive into to get started learning about Vision OS and Apple Vision Pro. Apple released Vision Pro developer stories in Q and A's. And I always love hearing, you know, developer stories like, your issues they ran into or their strategy for a new platform or how they designed it. And we got some top developers here sharing. So here's Flexbits and Fantastical. You can see some of the questions that were asked. There's a great screenshot of the app. You know, what was your initial approach to bringing Fantastical from iPad to Vision Pro? You know, how did you approach designing for Vision OS? How long did the process take, right? They're just sharing their experience, being one of the first apps on this brand new platform. And then we also have Black Box from uh, Ryan McLeod about how they reinvented the puzzle game using bubbles. So like I said, I love hearing these developer stories. Definitely check this out if you're interested in building for the Vision OS. Apple also released a Q&A on building apps for Vision OS. And this is kind of kind of like the basics. Like if you're just getting started, I might start with this article. You know, some basic questions. How can I interact with an entity using gestures? Quick little code example. Should I use a window group, an immersive space, both? You know, this kind of general questions. Can I position SwiftUI views within an immersive space, et cetera? And some basic code examples. But it's nice that like Apple themselves are issuing kind of like a frequently asked questions with, with their answers. And then Serenity Caldwell from Apple, uh, get some quick little design tips on how to design for Vision OS. And if you can't tell, I'm kind of giving you like a little Vision OS starter pack here. So there's a nice Twitter thread on various design tips, right? Kind of obvious ones, design window sizes that fit your content. A big one here is like add vibrancy effects to foreground content. Because of all this glass UI, right? The vibrancy is a big deal. Same thing, rounded corners. Everything in Vision OS is like really rounded. So sharp angles are like really gonna stick out. Another big one is targetable elements should be 60 points. Right, if you grew up in the world of iPhone development, you're used to the 44 point you know, touch target. Well, she does clarify the 60 point target is a 44 point button with eight points of padding. But anyway, just various design tips for you. And then finally, self-promotion. Me, myself, on my YouTube channel, I have a playlist that I'm starting. Vision OS, getting started, right? Vision OS fundamentals, AR kit, reality kit, and the video I just released yesterday, you know, my thoughts on working as an iOS developer in the Vision Pro and I break down what it's like to work in Xcode while mirroring your MacBook. So like I said, there's your Vision OS starter pack. Consume that content, go forth and start building amazing apps for this brand new platform. Next up, we have a simple yet mind-blowing tip on creating custom SF symbols by using composition here from Axel Lepenic. You, this is built right into SF symbols, right? So let's say you wanna create a book symbol with a little plus button. Well, that doesn't exist in the existing realm of SF symbols, but you see, duplicate as custom symbol. I'm going screen by screen here. You can combine symbol with component, right? And the component is going to be, uh, it's probably small, maybe we'll zoom in, like a little plus button, a minus button, or a little clock, or a little check mark. And then you create symbol, and now you have a book with a plus button. So this has been going around on Twitter the past couple of days. Everyone's like, whoa, how did I not know this? But again, I love SF symbols. I think it's one of the best things Apple's done in a long time for the you know, developer tools. And the fact that you can compose and combine symbols with different little like accessory views, ah, that's awesome. Like I wanna go redo a bunch of my SF symbols in my app. So awesome tip from Axel here. Now we have the Swift UI field guide from Chris Idoff, and I believe the team at objc.io, they write the book Thinking in Swift UI. I highly recommend reading that book. There is an affiliate link in the description, but it's how I learned how Swift UI works under the hood, you know, all the way back in, you know, 2019 when it first came out. So they really specialize, like I said, in like reverse engineering Swift UI and really figuring out how the system works under the hood. And they've created this website, the Swift UI field guide, as you see here. We built this website to visually explain how the SwiftUI layout system works. 
and it is in beta, as you can see there. So there's only a couple, you know, elements here, like alignment, h stacks, padding, aspect ratio, but this will grow over time. They're gonna add new sections to it. But again, if you're not even just a beginner, like if you're experienced, like, yeah, you're probably like, of course I know how an h stack works. And they start with the basics, but you can play with this website in real time. So you may know how an h stack works, but have you ever messed around with, you know, layout priority? Well, this explains that. And then what about the different alignments, right? You can play with this in real time. What does it look like if all my elements are top aligned? There you go, center aligned. First text baseline, bottom, right? And then you can play with the different values. So yes, it may seem like basic concepts, but you probably only know these basic concepts at the surface level. This website will dive deeper and give you visual examples that you can play with in real time. So like I said, Swift UI Field Guide seems like it's gonna be an amazing new tool very early they just released it expect more sections to come in the future but uh yeah just because you know the basics don't think you really really know them and it's always good to you know drill the fundamentals reinforce that basic learning that's going to help you in the long run this next website is a gift uh gosh darn format style there's a more explicit version but we'll keep it pg here on swift news but if you're familiar with the new formatter that came out in ios 15 you get a lot of built-in formats uh, from swift done for you However, there's a ton of different permutation and you can compose them in various different ways. So even though it is a nice, easy to use system, there's so many possibilities that, you know, it can be confusing. Well, that's where this website comes in. So we'll start off with just like numeric styles. For example, how I was using this in my app was, see this like 2K here? Like I wanted the number to be, you know, 42K, 32.1K or 1.1 million. So that's how I kind of went down this rabbit hole, but you can see the various properties, rounding, sign, decimal separators. But what I like is, they show you every possible permutation and what it outputs. Like say you want to round it, right? You can round the number away from zero, increment one, and then you'll see what the output is. Or you see this big long decimal, number, rounded, rule, away from zero, now you get this. So you see the output of every single possible permutation on the number formats. And that's just numbers, right? Let's go to date, date styles. It shows you all the different symbols you can use. And then again, all the different permutations. You want day of year, era, hour, minute, how you can combine those, what the output is. Let's go to actual date, time, and style. Like look at, again, however you want your date formatted, you know there's tons of different ways to do it. Here's exactly how to do it. Like I said, I could, I, I could just praise this website all day long. It's not just numbers, dates, there's currencies, percentages, and it shows you every output of every permutation. I love it, bookmark this site. It, it's gonna save you at some point. Moving on, Two Straws has released another open source library. We featured uh, his other one last episode. This one is Vortex. So this is working with particle emitters in Swift UI. Now, of course, not every app is gonna need fireflies or fireworks or fire, but a common one is confetti, right? You put confetti, you see confetti all over an app. So that might be the most useful case. But uh, as always, Paul has great documentation showing you how to use it within your app, right? You get a vortex view, pass in .fireworks .fire, and you can customize it, right? If you wanna create snow, you can customize all the different properties. So again, if you need particle emitters, snow, rain, confetti, whatever, Paul has released Vortex, uh, great open source library with great documentation, simple and easy to use. Now we have Donnie Wall's understanding and resolving merge conflicts. Now, merge conflicts are one of those things, like you can read all these articles, you can research it till you're blue in the face until you've actually experienced it an untangled crazy spider web of a merge conflict. Like that's when you really learn when you gain that experience. So I definitely recommend reading this article, but if you've never dealt with a merge conflict, you know, this isn't going to solve your problems. You kind of got to go through that pain yourself. But as you're going through that pain, this is probably a great article to reference because Donnie Walls talks about, you know, what a merge conflict is why a merge conflict even happens, right? And it's usually two developers working in the same file, right? So a good way that I practice that I use to avoid merge conflicts, again, this is easier on a smaller team, is to be like, hey, teammate, I'm working in, in this section of the app, this screen, this view, whatever, uh, try to avoid that for the next day while I do my feature, right? You can kind of communicate like that to avoid working in the same area of the code base, but the larger the team, obviously the harder that gets. But anyway, Long article, I'm not gonna really dive into the details too much, but Donnie Wallace talks about what is a merge conflict, how do they happen, how to avoid them, and then how to resolve them. So a great resource to have if you're, if you're going through that pain, this will help you out a lot. BA Swiftable and iOS conference in Buenos Aires, Argentina has released their videos from their conference all on their YouTube channel, right? The joy and pain of Swiss packages, the widget revolution, Searching for aliens, not sure what that one's <laughs> all about. Swift unit testing, best practices and design principles, demystifying app intents, tons of good information. Check out this playlist, all kinds of great talks from BA Swiftable.
Next up, we have Data.ai's State of Mobile 2024. They release this giant report every year. I'll go to the quick summary pages and show you what it's all about. If you're not familiar, they basically take a whole mobile landscape at a glance from like ad spend, usage, all that stuff, right? You can see new app downloads, 257 billion, that's crazy. But what I like to look at is the year over year growth, right? Are we growing? Are we shrinking? Like what's going on here? So basically the same 1% year over year growth, App store spend, like how much money are people spending on the app store? 171 billion, but we're growing 3% year over year. And then these are like usage, right? Time spent is five hours. Mobile ad spend, so this is how much companies are spending on mobile ads, that's growing 8% uh, year over year. But that's just the big picture glance. They really dive in, like here's the, the contents, right? AI and mobile, gaming, finance, retail, travel, food and drink. And I'm gonna scroll really fast now, but very visual, tons of charts, tons of graphs to really you know, demonstrate the points, right? This is consumer spend. And they break it down by like geography, right? So China, obviously, because population is way bigger than anywhere else, but you can see 2021, 2022, 2023 for downloads, consumer spend, our spend, you can look at it by country. But the whole report is a, a ton of pages. It gets into crazy detail. Highly recommend diving in and checking it out. So much good information in here. Moving on to a great article from Amy, and I love how she presented this whole thing in a story. I definitely recommend go checking it out. It's good, but I'll quickly sum it up here. Basically, use view builders more. And I say this to myself, right? I need to do this more because she walks through being tasked with a refactor on some code that's, you know, being reused. So something we've probably all done, like, oh, this view is being used more than once. Let me rename the existing view, expose properties like a title and an image text. You pass those properties in something like, you know, card view that takes in title, background color, whatever, right? We've probably all done that, but that's kind of like level one. And then maybe level two is, oh, I can make this a custom view modifier, right? Like card modifier. And then on the view, you just call dot displayed as card, and then you get all that card looking display. So it's kind of like level two. But what I like about what Amy does is she walks through thinking about this not just from like what's the easiest to implement. You have to think about like your teammates experience using the code base and not even just your teammates, maybe like you or your future self. So she says using this view modifier, right? It lacked discoverability. They may not even know it exists and has a high cognitive overhead on her colleagues. I love this phrase, high cognitive overhead. Have you ever been sitting there like looking at a teammate's code and you can't like talk to them, right? They're not sitting next to you. And you spend so much time thinking like, what is going on with this code? Like you spend so much time figuring out how it works, what's going on, what they were doing. So that's the high cognitive overhead. So if you can make things so easy to use, not just for you, but for your teammates, that's going to help the velocity of development for the whole development team. So keep that in mind, just because something may be easy to write, it may be hard to use. So I think you should err on the side of making the call site easier to use, which is where this ends up at on a view builder. So yes, this view builder code right here may seem a little more complex than just this view modifier, but look at the call site. Look how easy it is to use. Look how natural it feels as we get on here, right? You just call card and then it's just like a V stack or an H stack. So again, someone that's not familiar with the code base, but they're familiar with SwiftUI, this just feels natural to them, right? It feels like they're writing another VStack, except you're just writing a card and it gets that whole card looking style. So I wanted to share this article because I know I stop at level one most of the time, where I just extract the view, pass in a couple properties, boom, good to go, it's reusable anywhere you want. I think we should go to the next stage to make the call site and it just feel natural to use within the SwiftUI world. Moving on to the indie portion of the show, we have a great article from Jordan Morgan here about pricing indie apps. And he uses this quote, we accept the love we deserve, but he tells the story of like what he went through. So he had an app spend stack that got acquired, but he remembered it was a $2.99 one-time purchase. And this is something like we always like tell ourselves when we're building the app, oh uh, yeah, it, it's probably worth that much, but we almost always underprice things. Like that's the most common mistake when building a, a startup or an app or whatever. We underprice things and Jordan expands on that more because with his most recent app, Elite Hoops, which is seeing like very good early success, he said, I wanted to, if anything, overprice it at launch. Even if it is an MVP state, he said, I boldly said to users, hey, $40 a year or 10 bucks a month or a $150 one-time payment. Those are like expensive big numbers. Now I know many of you out there may be like, oh man, that's expensive. I can't charge that much for my app. But look, he says now three months later, he thinks he underpriced themselves. And this is the key insight, right? Because when you see your own apps, right? All you see is the holes, the missing features, the rough edges, the jerky animations, right? You, you just know too much about the product. And at the end of the day, if your product solves the user's problem, like they don't care about all that little stuff or right, you have this vision of the product in your head that's 100% complete and there's so many features, but your MVP may have 10% of that, right? So it feels weird to price that. But that MVP 
should still solve the core problem of your user. Now, of course, there's nuance, like he says, right? If your app sucks, like none of this matters, but don't worry about pricing too high because even if you price it at a dollar, you're still gonna get shit on the internet. And like, look, I'll be honest, I'm calling you guys out. The developer community is some of the worst offenders. So many times you post stuff about pricing and the other developers, because developers notoriously like don't like to pay for stuff, like, oh, that's too expensive. No one will pay for that. But most of the time, if you look at the data, like consumers say otherwise. So make sure you don't get too wrapped up in our developer bubble, because to be honest with you, we're giving bad advice on this. And there's an interesting like piece of human psychology going on here. Again, this depends on your target customer. Like I'll use my app Creator View for an example. I'm building my app for people that are running a YouTube business. Like essentially I'm building it for me. My YouTube business is multiple six figure business. So if I look at an app that costs $2, I'm gonna be like, mm. but if I saw an app that costs $100, $200 for my business, I'm gonna subconsciously lean to the more expensive one because that's just gonna signal quality, right? I'm like, am I really gonna run my business on a $2 app? Like, there's just that weird human thing. So again, this depends on your, your customer, but think about that too. Having a higher price might signal a higher value. And again, I'm not saying that's always the case, but something to think about. Next up, I wanted to share a cool widget from David Bernard and WeatherUp because it takes interactive widgets like to the next level. I think most of us, when we thought interactive widgets, oh, maybe I can press one button or do one little thing. Uh, yeah, David went a little crazy with it in a good way, all the good ways. So I'm gonna let this video play. You can see different forecasts. You can change the view completely and go back, go you know further into the week. It's basically like a little mini app, just all in the widget using interactivity. So. Uh, if you're building an interactive widget, definitely download WeatherUp, check this out, play with it, and just kind of see what's possible. This really opened up my mind. I'm like, oh crap, interactive widgets can, can be huge. Let's wrap up the show with some awesome examples of prototypes for Vision OS ideas to get your mind going on what's possible. First up, we have John Lepore here, F1 fan. He's not a developer, but he does, you know, like 3D mockups, but as an F1 fan, uh, this blew my mind how awesome this would be, like watching the race in your Vision Pro and you see the mock-up of the track, all the information you need over on the side, uh, seeing the tr cars go in real time, you can tap on it and see the driver view, like this, obviously we're not there yet, this is a prototype and a mock-up, but this is the future in a few years on the Vision Pro, watching sporting events, ah, just this was like, this got me so excited. And then some other fun, interesting was like chores are never gonna be the same again. I'm sure many of you probably saw this on Twitter, but hey, never wanna miss a spot vacuuming again. There you go. Map out your room in Vision Pro and make sure you hit all the spots on the vacuuming. And hey, if you wanna gamify it, throw some coins on there. Uh, get your high score. <laughs> there you go, I thought that was pretty fun. Again, people are just having fun with prototypes and what's possible in the Vision OS. However, this is real and very handy. You can actually mirror your iPhone into the Vision OS using an app called uh, Bezel, I believe. Yep, Bezel is now available on the Vision Pro because if you have the Vision Pro and you look at your phone, you know it's like a little blurry. It's You can still read it, but it's not a great experience. But mirroring uh, using Bezel, I think that's gonna really come in handy, especially if you're developing an iPhone app. All right, that wraps it up for this episode of Swift News. We'll see you in March.